so much for coming. You should have gotten your newsletter this week. And you know that we have a lot of upcoming programs. Our next one is going to be, I forgot to wave it, sorry. Thank you, thank you for coming. I had a lot of fun putting this talk together, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, I, it's a sort of a combination of uh, things I came across helping the museum in the archive, helping, I'm helping enter things into the computer database. Uh, some of it's from researching various companies um, so anyway, and it looks like we're all people who read newspapers when you opened the newspaper up as opposed to on the screen. Um, but anyway, so we're going to go through about a hundred years from 1853 to 1957 of news stories. And we'll start here in 1853, the Providence Daily Journal. City Improvements, and they have this in the story. I just obviously clipped the sentence out of the story. While other cities of the country are doing a great deal in the way of architectural improvement, we also are doing something. Who will be the first to erect a front exclusively of Smithfield marble or westerly granite? Now, 1853, this is just five years after um, Orlando Smith bought the farm, which is uh, in 1848. It's in the uh, Westerly Property Records, book 18, page 521. Now, he, in the archives, the museum has a purchase and sale agreement, which is the previous year, 1847. And, you know, so likely, and the, the plaque outside says that he uh, discovered the uh, grant in 1846. But, so this is pretty amazing that within just a matter of a few years, people are already, uh, locally at least in Providence, talking about um, making use of westerly grant, and when will there be a building with a granite front? So we're going to talk now about a building. There are all sorts of stories about buildings, so I just chose one. This one doesn't have a, a granite front, but this is from 1865, um, sorry, yeah. I didn't make that bigger. The annual report of the managers of the home for aged women. And at the bottom of the story in 1865, it's they're building a new building. It is thoroughly and substantially built. And Danvers comes up a lot for various um, like uh, public works, uh, pumping stations and stuff. So it was, you know, they always specify this Danvers brick in these news stories. With red westerly granite base course, water table, and window sills. 
And this the, I found in the Providence Public Library, Rhode Island Collection, is a picture of the building that was constructed at 180 Top Watton Street in Providence. This is that home. Now this building no longer exists, but the organization does still exist, and they have a new building across the river, and I took this from their website. Takwatan on the waterfront, which is what it's now called, is the beautiful evolution of the charitable spirit, optimism, and resolve of 16 Providence women who in 1856 took it upon themselves to establish a home for the elderly. So, um, 1856, they set up the organization. 1865, they've built a new building. So it doesn't have a lot of Westerly grant. It's not yet a full front, but it's interesting how the Westerly connection just allows you to enter into these stories of, of organizations and history in the area. So now we'll go to 1867. This is Thursday morning. This is back when newspapers had morning and afternoon or evening editions. And we have a story here that is a uh, serial, multi-part story. This is actually chapter 34 of Westerly and Its Witnesses by Denison, Reverend Denison, and it was then published later as a book in 1878, so about 10 years later. And the chapter in the book is a little bit different than what's in the newspaper, but it's, you know, the kind of writing that we would expect to read um, in the magazine or a novel. It's not at all what we would expect in newspapers today, but I'll read to you uh, this is, I blew up the text. While Westerly is indeed without her broad river valley, since her river rolls between rocks and hills, and comparatively destitute of large alluvium lands, yet not destitute of good soil, she has an unusual compensation for the ruggedness of her features in the great value of her hills. Now, Somebody didn't have an English teacher who told them that that was a run-on sentence. <laughs> the visions of the former money diggers have been realized in an unexpected form. The rocks and ridges of ledges, once thought a deformity and an obstacle, have lately been transmuted into treasures, changed to gold. Um, quarries of fine and beautiful granite surpassing almost anything of the kind in our country have been opened on the hills at the east and northeast of the village. These now engage hundreds of men and furnish not only elegant building stones but all manner of beautiful stone ornaments and superior specimens of monumental architecture. So, you know, this is 20 years after the quarries have uh, started to be developed. So in the next paragraph, already seven different quarries are yielding their crystal treasures. The varieties are white, blue, red, and maculated. The fame of these quarries has already gone far abroad over the whole country. From these rocks was chosen Rhode Island's block and contribution to the National Monument in Washington. So the story then goes on to talk about, um, oops, I just dropped the, okay. and I give them. So the story then goes on to talk about the seven quarries, Smith, Ledward, Frazier, McComber, Clark, there's a paragraph on each, Chapman, Lamphere, and then interestingly, a paragraph about the fact that the Native Americans had been um, using steatite soapstone from Westerly, uh, and obviously that was long before the quarries had existed. 
So this is one of the first sort of histories. I mean, it's only, what, about 20, 30 years after um, the whole industry had started and serialized in the newspaper. So I'm Hugh Barton, and Lazary and Barton was my great-grandfather's company. One of the great pleasures of helping uh, enter all sorts of items in the vault into the computer database is looking through all the binders and discovering things like this, which is Leatherhead, Lazary, and Barton, who were located in Woodlawn in the Bronx in New York, right across from Woodlawn Cemetery. It's an envelope addressed to John Cato or Cato uh, at 88 Granite Street from 1894. So that was fun for me to find. Of course, it's just the envelope, so I have no idea what the correspondence was. But even though they were mostly in um, Woodlawn, uh, they did own a quarry here in Westerly, and so there are all sorts, I gave a whole talk previously, but I'll just tell a couple of things here. So we have a help wanted ad from uh, 1891, and then in 1894, the Chronicle in Mount Vernon, New York, always published a little section about our nearby neighbors in Woodlawn. And this one says, Lazare and Barton will erect a mammoth dairy derrick in their quarry next week. So this is 1894. That's literally the only information I've ever found about the quarry here in Westerly actually operating. Um, they did, I, there is an 1894 sales brochure where they talk about the quarry, but there is no other information that I've ever found about the quarry here in Westerly directly discussing it. And then immediately under that is the interesting statement that my great-grandfather, H.W. Barton, has been a frequent sufferer recently from attacks of the grip. <laughs> now, why that's newsworthy? Yeah, it got me, but it was in 1894. Now, the Bronx and New York were growing, and so this is a story from 1897 that talks about that. The merchants who have offices and buildings along the line of 233rd Street are moving them back from all the new street, off the new street line. Lazare and Barton, Peter Sully, uh, Havender, P. Romer and Sons have already moved their buildings back. The work on the improvement is progressing rapidly, a large force of men being con kept continually at work. Now, one of the wonderful things when I was researching Lazare and Barton, and I showed this in my previous talk, but was to find that Yale University had this 1894 sales brochure with this wonderful picture that I love of their yard in Woodlawn. And this dirt road is 233rd Street that this article is referring to. This picket fence is the picket fence of Woodlawn Cemetery immediately across the street from their yard this yard having originally been operated by um, John Lazary, and before that he had bought it from somebody else's name I'm blanking on. But anyway, so this building, the office building, the Lazary and Barton name on the front and on the top, is obviously the building that had to get moved back as they widened 233rd Street. And maybe, I don't know, added cobblestones or something. I mean, you had, you know, still horses. So um, anyway, that's Lazare and Barton. I put this in to remind me to just tell you that there are wonderful resources available on the web for newspapers. So if it's a, a currently operating newspaper like the Providence Journal, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, you know, you need to access their websites and their archives either at a library that has access or um, pay for it. 
Um, but the Library of Congress has this website, Chronicling America, which has hundreds of newspapers that have been digitized across the country. Um, there are relatively few from uh, Rhode Island, um, but uh, those are newspapers that are you know, no longer uh, in operation. And then for New York, there's this specific site, uh, New York State Historic Newspapers, and so you can find these things online to some extent. So now we'll move to a different topic, which is one that comes up a lot about the interactions between the companies and their workers. And there's a long history here, obviously. And we'll start with 1892, the Providence Journal, The Struggle is On. New England quarrymen locked out yesterday morning. Uh, 15 to 20,000 workers thrown out of employment. Uh, although down here it tells us that uh, 1,200 men are out in Westerly. So obviously there's a, a substantial history that one could um, you know, research about the un worker union uh, uh, company interactions. And this is a, you know, those are the kinds of things that are reported in the newspapers much more commonly than somebody having the grip. <laughs> so then we have, um, let's see, 1895, just a couple years later, no trouble anticipated in the granite industry for two years. And then we have a story from 1901, increase in wages. Westerly granite comp cutters given 10% more. The granite business in the United States is the best it's been in 20 years. Westerly manufacturers are finding a dearth of good cutters and this has led James Gorley of the Rhode Island Grant Works to increase the wages of men on monumental and building work 10%. Good cutters command from 37 to 40 cents an hour, eight hours constituting a work uh, day's work. So that's 1901, and things were as good as they could be. And then we go on to 1922, and 600 will suspend work in Westerly. And we'll talk about the story from 1922 with Columbia Grant later, so we'll actually come back to this just a little bit. I put this in because I've recently been entering into the database, the binders, the museum has several that have um, union information from the different unions that uh, the workers belong to here in, in Westerly. And this is actually from 1930. It's a receipt uh, in um, you know, payment for strike. 1938, 130 Westerly stone cars will go on strike today. Now notice, the numbers have gotten a little smaller. You know, we talked about 1,200 back in 1892. And then finally, in 1947, granite cutters and employers arrive at Accord. Um, former is to return to work today. Ladder promises to install lung protection devices. So the whole history of the health impacts of stone dust um, is noted in this story. Now another common thing that's in the newspapers are um, various ads, such as help wanted ads. I put this one in because it was kind of interesting. It's from the Barry Daily Times in Vermont. Two expert carvers in granite, um, good wages, steady work year round. Joseph Fraser, Kimball and Comb Company, Westerly, Rhode Island. So not surprisingly, um, there's industry here in Westerly and up there in, 
in Barry, and so when they're looking for workers, they're not just advertising locally, they're advertising in Barry for those workers. This is an ad from 1922 for a, a blacksmith, because obviously you needed a whole range of different uh, trades and skills, and this one's from, uh, you're going to ask for Mr. Sullivan, the Sullivan Granite Company. Uh, other ads were ads for companies. So this is one for Kimball and Comb. This was their Help Wanted ad. This is actually, I think, for their site in Providence. And one of the funny things about being able to search things electronically is that you end up being very focused. This, this ad is at the very bottom corner of this page of newspapers. And sometimes I remember to look at the rest of the page. So this is the rest of the page, that and down here. Fashion and dress is voted an evil. <laughs> Wellesley and Smith graduates have debate. Um, girl kills lover's wife and herself. And then this one, interesting, Sakura Jima dealt death to hundreds. Detailed accounts of eruption showed great destruction. Story linked with Pompeii. So this is a, a um, volcanic eruption in Japan that you know killed substantial numbers of people. So anyway, sometimes it helps to look at the rest of the page. So now we'll turn to Columbia Grant for the next two stories and. Um, the story we're going to start with is from 1922, but first I'm going to give you a little background on Columbia Granite and on the story. Um, one of the sources of information that we have are these, the factory inspection reports. So this is the 28th annual report in 1922. Um, these started in the late 18. 90s. Originally, the inspections were specifically focused on women and children working in the factories and obviously the concerns of their uh, health and safety. But by this point in time, somewhere in the early 1900s, they started um, recording information, although they kept recording it by men and women boys and girls, I think under 16, if I remember right. Um, and so you have these um, from, uh, you know, the early 1900s through about uh, 1938, I think, is the last report. And so they actually list all the companies that were inspected in Westerly. And so I've highlighted in red the, uh, the granite companies that were um, at this point uh, in operation, we have Kaduri and Columbia, um, we have Kimball and Comb, who we've mentioned, New England Grant Works, and then uh, on the next page we have, um, let's see here, and yeah, just take my glasses off. Uh, Smalley, Henry Smalley and Smith Granite, and then out in Bradford we have Sullivan. Now, obviously they're listing not just the granite companies, I've highlighted two companies that will come up in the story we'll talk about in a moment. This one is Haswell and Sons Grocery, and this one is Westerly Lumber Company. And they tell the number of employees, men, women, and then boys and girls. So, 1921, we have the Sanborn insurance maps, which are wonderfully informative maps. So, this is a little inset in a, another map that shows the corner of Spruce and Oak Street. And so, here we have Columbia Granite Company. And across the street, we have Pellet and Sons. And this building here, actually in the Next map from, I've forgotten, the 30s or something, or maybe it's not, anyway. Uh, this becomes Frequelli and Brusa, actually, later years. Now, 
these buildings are all in yellow, which means that they're made of wood. And then it tells all kinds of other information. This is the blacksmith shop. That's the office. This is their um, outdoor traveling crane. It tells that this is one to two stories high because these maps were intended for the insurance companies to be able to figure out, you know, what they were needing to address in terms of writing insurance for these buildings. This, the H, is a hydrant out in the street. I've never found a picture of the outside of this building, but amazingly, on the museum, in the museum collection, on, and available on the website, is this picture, which is undated um, and attri attributed to be the Monty, so Monty's uh, owned Columbia Granite uh, location at Oak, presumably at Oak and Spruce Street, so the inside of this building. And you see all the men, and um, you see it's one story over here and then two stories here, so that's consistent with the uh, insurance company map. And this is a graph I created from all those um, factory inspection reports that are reporting the number of men working at Columbia Granite between about, what, 1905 or something up to 1938. Um, and you see that this period from about 1910 to 1916, 18 maybe, um, they have 14, 15 people. And if you count, there's 16 people there. So that may be when this picture is from. Um, well, I don't think it's from these layer times, and you'll understand about that in a minute. But um, So now, whoops, we'll turn to the story. December 6, 1922. And this is the front page of the paper. This is a... Um, evening edition with the headline, two aviation officers and four men die, ships crash in the air. I mean, this is a big deal, but over here on the left-hand side, we have a story which is Granite Plant Burn. Columbia concern on Oak Street destroyed. Alarm fails to ring. Officials of company estimate a loss at $40,000. So let me find. The story goes on. Uh, and notice, this is from the uh, microfilm in the Westerly Public Library, and you know, we've lost the line here because uh, of the text, but the entire granite cutting and polishing plant of the Columbia Granite uh, Unreadable Line by fire, which was discovered at about one o'clock this afternoon while the cutters and polishers were at work in the building. One of the men noticed a blaze in the partition near the engine room where the electric wires entered the structure. John Monty, one of the members of the firm, opened the door where the wires and switches were located. And then we'll come back to the story in a minute. But this was big enough news that the Barry Daily Times the next day, December 7th, published this short article about that the Columbia Granite plant had burned and the $40,000 estimated loss. Now, if we go back to the insurance uh, maps, this is the overview Sanborn map that identifies each of these different colors as a different map on a different page. And this page tells us a number of interesting things. So the first circle up here is Columbia granite. They, it identifies that the firehouse is there, which is, you know, where the firehouse is. Uh, in downtown Westerly. And then we have this text that tells us about the population is like 10,000 in Pocketux 4,500 and the fire department. Um, it 
provides a bit of description of the fire department. Whoops, what did I do? Sorry, push the button. Whoops, I went on. Oh no, I went back sometime. Okay, sorry, we'll get there. Okay. Westerly, three volunteer companies, 120 men, one chief and three assistants, one auto triple combo uh, pumping engine, etc. And then we have the uh, key down here, which I've already mentioned to you, the fact that um, in yellow, the buildings are uh, wood frame, and in red, they're brick. And so this is the map, the corner of oak and spruce, except Columbia Granite is on the other side of spruce in this little inset that I was showing you earlier. And notice that all the buildings in this area are wood, with the sole exception of that one brick building. There's Columbia Grant. There's Westerly Lumber, so you have not only wood buildings, but piles of lumber, and we're having a fire. Um, so let me tell you, read you some more of the story, because it is quite extraordinary. An attempt was made to send in an alarm. Remember, the headline said, the alarm fails to ring. An attempt was made to send in an alarm from Box 66, corner of Oak and Haswell Streets. And Haswell, of course, is right over here, parallel to Spruce. But the alarm could not be sounded from this box. It is understood that this line went out of commission shortly before 12 o'clock when one stroke sounded on the fire alarm at the engine house on Union Street. Telephone calls were sent into the central office of the Westerly Automatic Telephone Company. Automatic. They, you could dial up. This was a big deal. They had it in their company name. From the store of F.F. Haswell and Son, remember I mentioned that they were listed in the uh, factory inspection report? The Westerly Lumber Company, so the companies around are trying desperately to call in the fire alarm, and from several private telephones. But the operator who was in charge of ringing up the alarm at the telephone office was unable to sound it. An attempt was also made to get someone at the fire engine house on the telephone, but this effort was also fruitless. And finally, the bell was rung by Barney Fane at the engine house. When it was found that the box on Oak Street would not work, John Monty drove to the engine house in his machine <laughs> to summon assistance. So we don't know if it's a car or a truck, but it's a machine. Um, as soon as the alarm sounded, the entire apparatus of the Westerly Fire Department quickly responded, but when the firemen arrived on the scene, the cutting shed was a mass of flames. The flames were swept by a heavy northeast wind, and within 15 minutes, the main building and the engine room located east of the main building had been reduced to ashes. There were a dozen or more men at work in the building when the fire broke out, a few minutes after the noon hour. The flames spread so rapidly that the men were unable to save any of their working tools, which is a huge big deal, right? The cutting shed was about 30 feet wide and 125 feet long with an overhead structure outside about 100 feet long which carried the crane. The entire plant was fitted up with the most modern machinery for cutting, carving, and polishing granite. Everything in the plant was ruined and the loss is estimated at $40,000. 
Several pieces of finished and unfinished monuments valued at more than $10,000 were totally destroyed by the intense heat from the fire. One cross, which had practically been practically completed, upon which work estimated $1,000 had been done, lay like crumpled up chipstone after the flames had been extinguished. Another big piece of granite, which had been partly cut, split through the center as if done by a human hand. And the story ends, the Columbia Granite Company is composed of Elia Monti and his three sons, Americo, Louis, and John Monti. So it was quite the fire, but apparently didn't spread anywhere, despite all of the wooden building and all the lumber in the lumber yard and you'd think the just the embers might have set something off. So that's not quite the end of the story. So one of the wonderful things on the Library of Congress website is that they have the Norwich Bulletin and they regularly have a westerly column in that newspaper and so this is actually one of my major sources of information about things here in Westerly, in part because the Westerly Sun isn't digitized, whereas this is. And so there is this story, uh, December 29th, 1922, so a few months after the fire. Sorry, let me find my page. Elia Monti, president of the Columbia Granite Works, which suffered a big fire loss some time ago, is planning to rebuild his granite cutting sheds and is getting figures from the local building contractors preparatory to building. Now, in fact, they never did rebuild because a couple of years before this, they bought the site out on old Hopkinton Road. And in, they went on for another 30 years. The next story we're going to talk about from 1957 is again Columbia Granite, but that all takes place now out at the old Hopkinton Road site, which is what they developed. And they never did uh, rebuild this uh, site in town. This best, it's 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 not on the next insurance, Sanborn insurance map. There's nothing where the Columbia Granite building was. And uh, it's, um, so. Now, interestingly, right above that is another story about our 1922 labor situation, saying that the New England Granite Company, who conduct the largest granite cutting sheds in Westerly, have reached an agreement with their men and are to resume operations at the plant on Ledward Avenue. So there was quite a lot going on in 1922 between this fire and the strikes and so. So now we'll turn to 1957 and a wonderful story that um, I actually found again, as uh, the clipping is in the archives, and so I was, you know, <laughs> entering things into the computer database. Monty's cutting new life into lost art. And if you access the Providence Journal website, you find that uh, they had this Providence Sunday Journal, the state news and features, and there's the story on the, uh, the front page section on state news and features. Now, just to remind you, the company was founded in 1900 by um, Elia Monti and then his sons, John, who we heard about in the story about the fire driving his machine. Uh, Americo and Lewis joined the business and they paid taxes through uh, through 1958. So the Westerly tax books are all in the local um, collection and um, you know as of 1959 they're no longer listed as paying taxes. So apparently sometime in 1958 is when they shut down 
This story is from 1957, so just a year before that. And John Monty served on Westerly Town Council from 1929 to 45, so during the Depression and the start of World War II. And then again, 57 to 59, as well as um, serving as treasurer for several terms. So this picture, again, I wish that you know we could um, get a, a better copy of, of this picture. The caption says, Pneumatic hammer provides finishing touches on statue of the Lady of Assumption. Richard Camoli wields the hammer. Americo Monti is at the left. So Richard Camoli here and Americo Monti there. And the story describes the effort that's going on here. When Columbia Grant and Westerly this summer took a job for a Long Island family, they revived an art and a business which died in southern Rhode Island more than 30 years ago. This is a story from the Providence Journal. Under supervision of co-owners John L. Monty, president of the Westerly Town Council, and his brother Americo, sculptor Richard Camoli this week finished a seven-foot statue of the Lady of Assumption made of westerly pink granite. When the Monty brothers received the order for the memorial earlier this summer from a New York retailer, it was the first work of its kind uh, since they completed the memorial to their father, the late Elia Monty, founder of the 57-year-old business who died in 1946. For Mr. Camoli, 30, the work meant carrying on in his father's footsteps. So this is obviously very early in his career, and Richard Camoli would go on to have a, you know, a long career past this. The late Ferruccio Camoli was a noted westerly sculptor. Mr. Camoli decided eight years ago to become a stonecutter, and after an apprenticeship became a sculptor in his own right. Ever since Depression days, when John Monty first became a westerly councilman, some cutters have dealt almost entirely with grave markers and simple monuments. A statue the size and complexity of the one just finished after a summer's work by four men is so expensive that almost no one can afford one, the brothers explained. When it was shipped to New York next week, it will go to Hollywood Cemetery in Westbury, Long Island to mark the grave of the late Nicholas F. Handel, a New York lawyer, and so that's the um, completed monument on the right. Rough work on the statue was done by the Monty brothers and by Andrew Anderson of Westerly, the fourth member of the Granite Firm. So the Granite Firm at this point in 57 is four people. I showed you the chart from uh, 19, you know, 05 to 37 when you know, some, some years they were that small, but they tended to be around 10 to 15, even up to 25 um, when they first moved out to old uh, Hopkins Road. Delicate figures of angels and clouds on the base of the statue, fine hair and robe details, and the upraised hands, all difficult to carve, were chiseled and shaved into form by Mr. Camoli. So it's nice that in the story they give us a bit of a picture of you know how the work was actually done with the rough work done by the Monty brothers and uh, Andrew Anderson and then Richard Camoli coming in and doing the fine uh, finishing sculpting. Granite sculptures is a risky business in which mistakes cannot be made. If too much stone is chipped off, it can never be replaced. If one of the delicate hands were broken, for example, the entire work would have to be started once again. Quote, we're always subtracting. We can never add on as with a plaster statue, end quote, Mr. Camoli said. Those hands were the most difficult because they were shaped last and after all the other work had been done, end quote. In addition to the statue, the Handel Memorial 
called for a heavy base and framework with a cross on top, which you see in the picture on the right of the, from um, find the grave of the completed monument. Those parts were made separately by the Montes and will be cemented or pegged together when the memorial is in place. A plaster model with detailed markings and measurements was used as a guide for the figure. After the rough work was done, a pneumatic drill and carbide drills were used to transform stone into recognizable form. Steel drills are too soft for westerly granite, the men said. Mr. Monty explained how much the granite sculptor business has declined. Quote, when I went into business with my father in 1909, he said, there were about 600 stone cars and sculptors in the area. Today, there are only half a dozen or so. So at one level, it's a wonderful story about creating this, you know, fairly elaborate uh, monument and, and, you know, uh, uh, in a uh, story about uh, very early in Richard Camoli's career when he was working with Columbia Granite and um, before he moved on. So I'm going to show you one last figure which I've been putting together uh, largely based on uh, the business directories that were published every couple years but also tax records and a few other things. What this shows you is the time period from uh, 1840 to 2000. And each bar is a company, or sometimes I put two companies together, um, like, um, uh, anyway, they were the same, you know, person, major person. And there are 79 companies here. There's about another 30 companies that I don't have on this graph. But you see here Smith Granite starting earliest and continuing as long as, uh, just about as long as anybody. Of course, Bonner, who um, existed, you know, into the most recent times. Um, and then I've just highlighted a few other companies, Kadori, who we've talked about, Kadori, Sullivan, Columbia, and Lazary and Barton. So looking at the length of time the company existed and uh, in some way, this is from the tax books, it's a little misleading because yes, they were good citizens and paid their taxes on their quarry land that they owned um, out there. But really, the, I think that quarry only operated a little bit back here in the 1890s when they first uh, acquired it in 1891, um, probably largely stopped operating if it had operated that long around in the 1910s when both my great grandfather and John Lazary died and the rest of this, they, they really never did anything. But you see here that 1890, to, sorry, 1880 to 1900, these are every 20 years, you know, there are all these companies, some of which last for, you know, 20 or 40 years, and then there's a whole bunch of companies that are very short-lived. And the 1900 to 1920 is when you have the most companies that started earlier or were formed during that time period. That's really when you have the most companies in operation. And then after World War I, you know, things really dropped back to having um, those major companies who I described in 1921 in the, um, in, in the uh, uh, factory inspection report, you know, so Kudori, Sullivan, Columbia, and a few others. And that's all the names of all the companies. And so I've taken you through about 100 years of granite history in the, from the newspapers and other sources, and thank you.
Yes. What age is the women's the women's men's children? So I don't know how young. All I know, uh, I haven't read all the texts, to be honest, in those. I went through uh, and, and uh, uh, photographed at the archives in, in Providence the, the pages, so we had the information for the westerly uh, granite companies. But the cutoff, I believe, was age 16. So if they were older than age 16, they were listed as men or women. If they were younger than 16, they, they, younger than 16. they could be working there younger than 16, then they were listed as, as uh, girls or boys. But I don't know how young they could be. I just know they're less than 16. And then Westerly, I mean, not surprisingly, almost all the employees are men. There are a couple of women, like at Sullivan and Smith, who I would guess might have been working in the offices. Um, and I don't recall in at least 1921 that there were any uh, children working in the granite companies that were reported. Remember, this is what's reported. Um, uh, maybe there was one. Yeah, Maureen. When did you find the insurance? They're wonderful. Um, they're online. They're online at several different places, and I can. I'm happy to point people to URLs. Um, uh, Brown University has a set. I think their set is the set that's in color. Um, there's an, another whole set that um, uh, I don't remember actually where they are, um, but they're all just in black and white. Now the originals are in color and it helps to have the color because as I was showing you, you know, all the, the buildings in the wooden buildings in, in yellow. Um, they're issued like every five to 10 years in some cases uh, I think that 1921, I think the next one after that is an update on the 1921. Um, and one of the things is that they don't show like all of Westerly. I showed that, that overview map. Um, you know, so uh, they're showing the areas where there's enough uh, developed buildings and particularly, you know, where people would need insurance. So. You know, I, I'm not sure because I've never looked into the other, I think there are homes in the developed areas, but you can have many homes that, you know, are on streets where you have, you know, just whatever, a few homes, and those streets aren't even on the map. Um, if they're in the area that were, you know, those colored, then they're, then they're there and the buildings are there. Uh, the man here and then the woman at the back here. Are the quarries depleted of usable granite? At this point in time? So there are people here who are more knowledgeable than me. I think the issue is less the, you can comment. Uh, I think the issue is less whether there's usable granite than that, you know, even when the quarries were in operation, they had to run the pumps in order to keep them dry. And so, um, you know, when um, like Bonner bought one of the quarries, I've forgotten, Sullivan, and you know, you had to pump it all out again because I mean, the, the Lazary and Barton, there's a couple of ponds, you know, the quarries are all just ponds at this point, I mean, these older quarries. And so I don't know the degree to which the, um, the stone has been, the good stone has been used up as opposed to that you need a lot of infrastructure to be able to quarry. Does anybody else want to comment well, on that? The stone is still there in the earth, but it's much too expensive to extract. Yeah, I the think. Stone, we're sitting on top of the stone right now. <laughs> uh, my grandfather would part off and uh, say, there's two ounces over. That uh, the, those pumps 
be running 24 hours, but uh, if they stopped, they can hear that they stopped. <laughs> they didn't notice that the hearing when they were running, but when they stopped, oh, the pump was stopped, they'd have to go get them going. Right. But these holes yeah. are 165 feet deep, yeah. and, uh, and there's a lot of water in them. So yeah. the, the rock, we're all standing on it. It's, there's plenty still there, right. but there's not a want for it. And, uh, and there's just two to get and, and you know, these days you don't build buildings of, of granite, you build buildings of steel and maybe you sheathe them with the granite sheathing. And so places like Barry, Vermont and other places around. So there's just fewer locations. And of course, Westerly Grant was particularly known as very fine quality, small grained granite that was excellent for carving, for sculptures. Um, and so, you know, there aren't very many sculptors who work in, in stone, granite, marble, or any of them these days. So. And you come, just to comment on that, you said to work in sculpture, it takes a fine grain to do that. Right. And if, if it's not fine, it's tough to come. Right. Yes, in the back. Um, so I, so in the, um, what's the book called? Built from Stone. Built from Stone that the museum ha has copies of and published. There are stories about the, the several different ethnic groups that were involved in the granite industry and some folks here know uh, better than me who they were. I don't remember there being any Chinese in this area. The large uh, importing of Chinese labor was for building the railroad across the country. And there were, you know, very discriminatory laws passed after that um, to, uh, you know, disallow Chinese people from coming, from you know, marrying non-Chinese, et cetera. I mean, it was horrendous. Um, so, so lots of thin Scots and Irish because they're, they're all foreign countries. Right, Finland, Scotland, Ireland, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, you have uh, Chinatowns, obviously, on the west coast like San Francisco, on the east coast like Boston and New York, but um, yeah. 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 Um, you know, again, in the um, local collection room at the Westerly Public Library, you have the city directories. And, you know, I've looked through some of those um, looking for, like, John Lazary, actually, according to his obituary, spent two years in Westerly, but we don't have those directories in the library. So, you know, to some extent, I think if, uh, and, and more obviously you have the census records. So I think one would be able to identify, you know, at least by name, uh, you know, oriental names if they were there. And personally, I've never come across. Yeah. Yeah, so the book has a list of what, a couple hundred, several hundred names, right, everybody they could find. Um, so yeah, I don't think that information is correct for the Westerly Grand industry. Yeah. You talked about a fire, we have the artifact from the Kajuri fire uh, here in the museum. So right. there were at least two granite works that burned to the ground. Right. Right. right, so that was later, I don't remember what year, 34, yeah. So that's, real, you know, just almost a decade later, but not a lot more. Did you rebuild, John? Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it meant all kinds of things. So um, you had companies that focused on quarrying, and so you obviously had you know, the people who worked in the quarries, who uh, you had all kinds of skills, and over time the skills involved in quarrying changed. So there are newspaper stories um, about you know the introduction of pneumatic uh, drills, you know where previously everything was done by hand. Um, you had you know originally you um, conveyed the granite on ox carts, you know specially built carts um, to take them to either to the train or to the water, and so you had to have people who took care of the oxen. Later on, you had train lines that were built, um, you know, spurs that came in to Smith and New England Granite and, and uh, I think over out at uh, Old Hopkinton Road where Columbia moved to. So you had, you know, so you had all kinds of skills. You had blacksmiths, you had, and then you had the shops that focused on creating monuments, and some companies did both. Smith granted, obviously, both, you know, quarried, had um, uh, the, maybe the largest quarries in, in Westerly, but also, um, you know, sculpted, you know, all these monuments, the Civil War monuments, uh, all these Gettysburg and everywhere else, and, you know, they ha there were large contracts for um, building stones. So that's another thing you find in the newspapers are notices of that um, contracts were given to this company, that company, and the other company. You know, cobblestone streets, as we I always thought of them. Um, so you had to have the people who had the the skills to um, to split stones, to cut stones, to uh, just the whole gamut. Salesmen, right. Right, and right. You had to build all the buildings. You had to have plumbers to maintain things and roofers, and I mean, you know, these were blacksmiths, blacksmiths, all, just all kinds of skills. Um, if you have time to, at some point, to look at. The book built from stone, they have a lot of description in there of uh, all sorts of different jobs that people did and, and the family stories of like, you know, kids running lunches to their, their fathers who were working in the quarries and so forth. Yes? Did they have an uh, apprentice program? How did, how did the skill get passed? Uh, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for another company, and he was very proud that he was the first Smith in uh, what three or four generations who learned how to cut stone and got his master's ticket as a, a stone And in fact, you know, in that story about Richard Camoli, he apprenticed, the, and I think initially with Columbia Grant. Now, at the point that that story, he's carving that sculptor. He's, you know, I think passed his apprenticeship and and. Uh, Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.